You know, a warning only works if you pay attention to it. You know, kind of like stop signs. Now, how well do stop signs work in your your area? You know, where I live, California, we invented what's called the rolling stop. They even call it a name. They call it the California rolling stop. And police officers hate that because often we find that in rolling through a stop sign, the person isn't paying as much attention to observing the stop sign and doing what it says as they are willing to compromise what the stop sign says and not do what it mandates for you to do. Which, to put it bluntly, is behind the stop line, which can be the crosswalk or a stop designated line that's put in the road, for safety's sake as well as for the driver's safety and the pedestrian or anybody else that's out there, you're required to come to a complete non-rolling stop, meaning that you have stopped completely, you have braked sufficient that the car has come to a immobile state. Then, as you accelerate into, once having made that stop, you are able to proceed with caution into the intersection or wherever that stop sign is put. The same thing is true in life, you know, I mean, there's lots of times where we're told different things. I mean, when we're a child, we're told, no, don't do that. You know, when we stick our hands in the fire, you're going to get burned. Well, if you stick your hand in the fire, you will get burned. Later on, we learn, you know, as adults, that we can stick our hand near the fire without getting burned, sometimes to get warm. So we have our own reasoning and justification for doing some of the things we do. And we try to adapt to them as best we can. But a warning is only as good as you pay attention to. When I woke up yesterday and the day before, I checked the weather report because I have tomatoes growing behind me that you can see. And I have a porch that's kind of like a little bit chaotic looking, you know, on camera. And I grow things, you know, I like growing plants and letting people see nice, pretty plants. And I like to look at them and I like to record them for video. But you know, when I check the weather report, you know, I, I notice if it's frost, because then I bring them behind the camera, I have this little room kind of plasticated off so that I can make a greenhouse effect. When it says frost damage, I make sure I can cover my plants because I don't want them to die. I want them to grow. I pay attention to what the frost warning is and how long it might last. When I was told a few days ago that it was going to be windy, you know, I paid attention to what it said. I said, ooh, it's going to be windy. So I started moving my plants around. I started getting them situated so they wouldn't blow over, blow out, or be broken, their stems, so that they would continue to grow as these tomato plants. But I really didn't know how bad the wind was going to be. And it's blowing pretty hard. And this is just the beginning of it. I'm told it's going to get worse. Well, I've taken the steps and the measures to prepare my plants for strong winds. I prepared for those things that I warned would happen. Jesus told us in the latter days that violence would increase. It'd be a sign of the times. He told us that trials and tribulations would increase, like birth pangs coming upon a woman, that they would increase in severity. They would increase in magnitude. They would get worse and worse the sooner that we knew that Jesus was returning. It would become very obvious, even like a birth pang is very obvious to a woman in labor. When you're in labor, you know it, don't you? So you see, when people tell me, oh, why does bad things happen to good people? I kind of go, well, he already told you why. These things are going to happen. sheriff to stop people from carrying guns, you know, so that way in the city you were safe. Cities of refuge, so to speak. God wanted to have these places where you didn't have to carry a gun or possess a gun or own a gun. So a lot of people didn't and they quit doing that. And in what we call civilized areas, we don't carry weaponry for protection or to kill each other. So a lot of times 
we don't pay attention to the warnings. We choose to think we can get away with what we're doing. You know, kind of like Jesus warned us they that live by the sword would die by the sword. When we choose the violent means of lifestyle, we're going to die by a violent means of lifestyle. When we provide around us opportunities for someone to steal, rob, and destroy, like Satan said he would, then we just give the devil a playground to play in, don't we? We give him the opportunity to use those things. Oh, we can have them according to grace, but we never expected someone to abuse them in the way that they have. So you see, I sometimes wonder about when people say, oh, well, you know, I can have an arsenal. Why not? You know, it's legal. It's possible. I can have as many guns as I want. You know, and that's true. You can have as many guns as you want. And some guy drives by the street, you know, and happens to shoot a stray bullet, you know, and happens to set off your armory. <laughs> Excuse me. Or guess what happens most of the time is that people find out you have an armory. And guess what? The armoire is not what they're robbing. It's the armory that they're stealing. Because Satan is alive and well and living on the planet Earth. He loves to see Christians deceived into conceiving ways that he can manipulate them into violence and the perpetuation of spiritual darkness in the world. As we see the times, they are changing. It has gotten worse and worse, not better and better. Now, people can say to themselves, ah, you know, the stock market's up. Yeah, it is, you know. Why is kind of an interesting reason, but you're right, the stock market's up. The wind's blowing, but it's not that bad. Well, you know, yeah, you're right, it's not that bad, unless you're out in it, you know. Warnings are there for a reason. God gave us warnings. God gave and made provision for us to prepare, to be ready. He said that even when it comes to dying, we should have prepared ourselves ahead of time because he even warned those who used the excuse of not serving Jesus or following him. Uh, you know, Lord, I, I'd love to follow you, but i got to you know, take care of my grandfather. Let the dead bury the dead. What? Are you kidding me? Man, I love my grandfather, so i got to go bury him. No, you don't. You need to do what the Lord tells you to do. But, you know, Lord, I need to, um, you know, kind of get my house in order. No, he already warned you. Get your house in order, period, before you come to me. You see, there's a lot of things that people use as excuses rather than reasons. Because the only rationale for a reason is to do as God says. Because God will allow you the opportunity to take care of all these other things if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. See how that works? One will take care of the other. The other gets in the way of one. You need to figure out which way you're going to go. Are you going to excuse yourself for not doing what the warning says? Or are you going to make excuses for why you failed so miserably when you were already given the warning? I look around and I see so many people, sadly, not ready for the end times. And I don't mean being a prepper and getting your little, you know, stash together. You know, you got to get your guns, got to get your ammo, got to get your food, got to get your water, got to get this, got to get that. No, I'm talking about the spiritual preparation that you should be aware of. The deception that has gone on in this world of thinking, hey, I'm okay, I'm fine, you know, you know, I, I just need to get a gun, you know, and I'll be all right. Really. So, when the time comes, as a Christian witness before the Lord takes you home, would you be a murderer? Oh, I, but Lord, it was done in the name of defense. Oh, okay, that's a good excuse. But Lord, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, I know that I should have been feeding the poor, you know, and clothing the naked and taking care of these people, but they were, they were criminals. They were repeat offenders. I, uh, they, they, they were just, you know, like, trying to get my goods, steal my stuff, take, you know, what was mine. Okay, if you say so. And as much as you've done it to the least of my brethren, murderers, 
killings, justified killings, justified defense mechanisms, justifiable homicide, taking a life. You've done it unto me. Jesus said, love your enemies. And I don't think somehow that transfers into self-defense mode and mechanism. But God, don't you understand? I had to defend myself. After all, you couldn't, you couldn't, you didn't. And now look at my kids, they're dead. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord? I don't think so. You took them away. Oh, wait a minute. You mean that guy that killed them didn't take them away? You mean you were in control all along the way? You mean I'm going to see them in heaven or I'm going to see them in hell? Well, I won't see them in hell, obviously. But you mean you have the whole thing under control and it's being used for your purposes? You mean that murderer might be repentant enough to be convicted and, you know, probably die because of his sins, but wind up getting saved from his actions? God, I can't handle that kind of interpretation. Only some mind beyond mine could really do something like that. And as much as you've done it to the least of my brother. You know, we're not called to be perfect examples of who God is. But we are called to be an example of paying attention to the warnings and preparing ourselves. Because what little bit we have, God will add the increase. God will increase our faith when we need it. The time of our realization of Jesus is now. We should be growing in the grace that we've been given so we could extend grace to those that need it in the time that they're going to be required to have it. But there's also a time coming when the Holy Spirit, represented as oil, would only have so much for us. And if we've used up what little we have, that little bit that we have will be taken away. So let me ask you, when you think of the Holy Spirit as peace, love, and joy, meekness, kindness, temperance, gentleness, grace, mercy, forgiveness, are you forgiving more now than you ever have before, or less? Are you at peace more with all the violence going on, or are you defending yourself and getting your rights and righteous causes and stepping up and stepping out and standing up and standing about all these causes and statements that are so Christian, you know, of course God wants us to exercise our rights. By golly, we can't let it go. we got to say something, you know. Are you praying more? Are you having faith more? The shield of faith. Are you trusting God more? Or really, by your actions, are you trusting Him less? Oh, you know that. I know for me. <laughs> It's a challenge. I have to look at the warning signs and pay attention. I have to examine whether I'm prepared for them. I have to look at myself and say, man, I've got a chill, so I need to put on a coat. I've got the sniffles, so I need to take some vitamin C. I need to consider where I am in the faith. And if I need to grow, then I need to go where I need to grow. God is glorified in our moral victories. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans 8, 6. You know, I like that. To be spiritually minded is life. Oh, you mean you're supposed to be so spiritually minded, we're no earthly good? Don't be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good? I wonder if you ever heard that before. I have a lot. Anytime that I start teaching, man, I always get somebody somewhere going to you know, pop up with some statement that says, man, you don't want to be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And I tell them, I would hope and pray that I be more heavenly minded, that I be all earthly good. Because frankly, <laughs> the person who's not heavenly minded is no earthly good. Because heavens come to earth in the form of Jesus. And since then, salt and light appeared because we were in darkness. And if you think that being practical is being in darkness, my practical mind says I need to be in the light as he is in the light. Because what fellowship has light with darkness? Don't tell me about practicalities. The practical person 
immediately becomes so spiritually minded, so heavenly minded, so focused first on the kingdom of God and his righteousness that all these other things are taken care of and added unto us. In the Pauline epistles, so to speak, those that are written by Paul, the letters, the gravitational pull of the heart in one direction or another is called the mind. In the 8th chapter of Romans, for instance, when Paul refers to the mind, <laughs> mind, mind, d, d, I say that. The reason why I say mind is because mind is dumb. Mind, mind dumb. Mind dumb is my idea of what most men are and most women are because it's mind dumb, mind. If we put on the mind of Christ, his Christ, his mind, you know, then we have a whole different perspective. Just kind of a silly thing. Mind. He's referring to the sum of our dominant desires. There's a lot of D's in this, so that's why I always say mind dumb. Just dumb, dumb, dumb. The mere intellect, then, is not the mind. The mind is intellect plus an emotional tug strong enough to determine an action. As Christians, our only safety lies in complete honesty. Yep, I blew it. I did it. I'm the wrong one. Uh-huh, you betcha. <laughs> Leave me alone, I'm gone. We must surrender our hearts to God so that we have no unholy desires. Then let the scriptures pronounce their judgment on a contemplative course. I see so many unholy desires, you know, like, I don't know, people say they want to stop abortion, but they want to do it to sacrifice the gospel on the altar of confrontation in order to not have the chance to change the person who might be wanting to be saved and save the mother of a child that's unborn. But no, we want to stop abortion instead and separate ourselves from ever having the opportunity to share the gospel to anybody else that might be receiving the opportunity for salvation so that we could offer an alternative to that person who might have to make the choice because there may be the opportunity within democracy to have the freedom to choose as they decide within themselves according to the law of the land as opposed to the moral decision of the person that we should be changing them from the inside out as opposed to the outside in because you can't legislate morality. But no! Our godly desire is to legislate morality. we got to make them believe Make them not do that. Make it a law. Make it a mandated, religious, driven fact. You can't change anybody. You don't change society from legislature. You change society from the heart of man, one at a time. One man, one heart, one person, one choice. Christians have it all backwards right now. Sadly, that's the way of the world. And it is spiritual darkness in this world. If the scriptures condemn an object, we must accept that judgment and conform to it, no matter how we may, for the moment, feel about it. To want a thing or feel that we want it and then to turn from it because we see that it is contrary to the will of God is to win a great battle on the way to spiritual mindedness. If we are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we're not seeking first the kingdom of America and its legislature. If we are seeking first to share the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ to the changing of the heart and the development of the mind so that they would come into conformity with what God's will is according to the biblical scriptures, we're not seeking to topicalize our Christianity into those political activisms that cause people to separate themselves along divisiveness lines and choose to observe a democratic process whereby the freedom to be something other than what God has determined for them to be is made available to them as opposed to the theocracy of God which says that you would choose out of love to become what you want to be. Sorry, politicking is not really a Christian godly desire. It's more of a political and democracy is the ultimate failure of government. To bring our desires to the cross, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Or do you? Are your desires nailed to the cross? Quite frankly, you can put anything you want, whatever you're doing right now, Put it on the cross and see what it looks like with what Jesus said. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And as much as you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. So pick someone. 
pick your worst enemy and put them on the cross and tell me what you're supposed to do with them as opposed to what you're doing to them or you want to legislate about them. We're getting the message wrong, folks. we got to turn from our ways and seek the Lord and His face and to acknowledge His will and His way, not our desires, but what we want our way. To bring our desires to the cross and allow them to be nailed there with Christ is a good and beautiful thing. To be tempted and yet to glorify God in the midst of it is to honor Him where it counts. When you are provoked, you reveal where God is. When you are challenged by those things that you abhor, you reveal where God is. Did God turn his back on the people when they crucified him? Or did he look down upon them? And in all beauty and glory of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, say to the entire universe, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. God, forgive them. They really don't know what they're doing. This is more pleasing to God than any amount of sheltered and untempted piety could ever be. If you've never been tested, you're just a superficial Christian. Until you actually get where you're challenged, the Lord said, whom he loveth, he chasteneth. God is not going to leave you unless you have left God to be sheltered from the storm, but he's going to put you in the wind and protect you from its onslaught by preparing you with the warnings that he's already ascribed to you in his word, stating that these things are coming upon you in order to try you, that you would go through the hour or the time of trials and tribulations, that you should be tested to see what manner of faith you have. And so when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? The question is, when you are tested, will you prove you have faith? Because anyone can say, oh, well, you know, I want to get more than I already have. I want to get peace or whatever it is that you're claiming and naming and shaming God's gospel of grace for and say, oh, I want, I, 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 I. But when you have nothing and God says, give, when you have someone who unrighteously abuses you, when you are raped, when you are murdered, when you are killed, when you are afflicted, when you are tempted to condemn, the choice is yours. But the choice you make reveals your faith. What choice you make in those times determines your faith. It's just a trial. Eternity is held in the balance, as it was on the cross. For Jesus could have said, Enough! I'm done! I'm out of here! And he didn't. But when it was time, and he yielded up his spirit to God, he said, It is finished. It is accomplished. It is done. And he died. The worst example of Christianity we go by in modern era is never admitting to the Christian who's making the choice to follow Jesus that the potential for death is there and that you are called to give up your life and die that Jesus might live in you. Where's your faith? Who is your faith in and what? Because if it's in prosperity, the warning's already out there. It will evaporate. It will be like a bag of gold with a hole in it, and it's just slowly being taken away. Whether you want to call it taxes or you want to call it Obamacare, you know, or blame it on someone out there. You know, there's always someone to blame. Well, if if the slots had only come up in my name, you know, or if I if I'd only had the right resource, you know, or if the lottery had only won, if 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 if. if blame someone. You can blame anyone. But God is always glorified when he wins a moral victory over us and in us.
And we are always benefited immeasurably and gloriously benefited by Him, with Him. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses not only our actual sins, but the very inward desires so that we will not want to sin. The blood of Jesus Christ doesn't just cleanse us from outside to within, but it starts from the inside working out to change our desires so we no longer want to sin. Now that's a blessed state, and a blessed state indeed to reach it. For myself, I know that sin had no real effect on me. I began to choose to sin because I liked it. I began to sin because I wanted it. It was fun. Oh man, it's like, you know, when you sin, you know, it's like there's a good feeling. It feels good. It really does. And, you know, talking about what's going to happen in the sweet by and by, I know, just like you and I, you know, hey, <laughs> down the road, I can ask for forgiveness. And, you know, blah, blah. so when people say, well, no, you know, you don't, nobody ever thinks like, you know, well, I can ask for forgiveness and we're sin abounds, grace must more abounds, so I'm going to sin more. Well, they don't think of it the way it's written, but they do it in their practical day-to-day -day living. Because I was one of those. I, I know exactly what you're trying to compromise, what you're trying to pretend and grace cover glazed eyes say to God. Well, forgive me, I'm sorry. And then move on and do it again. But you know, the place comes and the time and the place where you see what sin does to everyone around you. When you see how much it affects the church you're in. When you realize you caused the church to stumble. You caused your pastor to fumble. You caused your elders to become hardened of heart. You caused your deacons to miss the ball or miss the meeting. You caused your wife to fall away. You caused your husband to be led astray. You caused your children to disobey. You, your sin. When you begin to see that, you choose not to sin. Because it's not what the sin does to you that will change you. Because most people will compromise with that eventually. No. The fact is, what sin does to others will stop you dead in your tracks. Once God reveals to you, it was your fault, not theirs.